Welcome to the Absinthe release webinar 18.10. My name is Christian Hümbert and I'm glad to present to you the latest features of our binary level analyzer Stack Analyzer, IT, Time Beaver and Timing Profiler. Let's get, get started with ICE annotation related changes and um, First, we introduce a new default mapping with this release. Um, the default context specification is now equivalent or same for all analysis types, independent if you do stack or timing or value analysis. We have the following mapping now as a default. The maximum length for the call strings is set to 2 and the default unroll behavior for all loops in the analyzed task is also 2. Previously, uh, we distinguished between stack analysis and timing and value analysis with um, those values. We think this is more consistent to have the same um, default context specification over all analysis types. We also introduce new ICE2 functors in this release. Index of parameter and number of parameters. Um, to explain the, the meanings of these functors, uh, let me give you an example. Assume you have a C function table lookup, which you are going to analyze uh, with the binary analyzers. This function comes with um, a set of parameters like this. Uh, you have three parameters. The first one is an pointer to an integer array. The second one is an um, integer element. And the last one defines the length and type short of this array. So on a binary level, for instance, in the PowerPC case, um, those parameters would be transported via the following machine registers. R3 for the first parameter, R4 for the uh, second parameter, and R5 for the third one. This is defined um, by the compiler's calling conventions. Now, assume further that you want to provide an annotation, which you always um, do for, for the binary, uh, level. Um, so in this case, for instance, you could um, provide a loop bound annotation for the table lookup uh, L1 bound and uh, you want to provide a bound uh, which is relatively um, specified to the length parameter and um, on, in the binary analyzer uh, you have to refer to the machine register, R5 in this case. But it could definitely make sense that you also provide an additional uh, assertion to guarantee that your um, functions interface stays the same so that you are really sh uh, can, can be sure that the length parameter stays transported in register R5. And you do that, you can do that with such an assertion. You, you say that when you enter the table lookup function, then the index of your parameter length is, equ well, is equivalent to um, the index 2, which is number of parameters, would be 3 minus 1, it's 2, and we start with the index 0 always. So by this assertion, you guarantee that um, your length parameter is transported um, over the third register, and because of the calling conventions, you can be sure that the third parameter is always given by register R5. So by, pro by using these two functors, you can increase your um, safety here, and your confidence that the provided annotation um, is still correct. In 18.10, we introduce a new annotation scope with for loops. And I've prepared two examples um, to explain uh, where for loops in the annotation file could make sense and could make the um, specification more compact and more elegant. So. In the first example, I'd like to annotate the content of some task table um, array, especially the new component of um, the structure elements uh, in this table. Um, and I'd like to assign the index of um, the corresponding element. So in the, the first element with index 0, 
in the NU component, I want to store the value 0. And the next element with index 1, I want, would like to store uh, the same index 1, and so on. And this table has um, obviously four elements. I could now do that much more elegant using a for loop annotation scope. And this would look like this. So uh, you would define a for loop where you uh, specify a loop counter variable i in i's and you let loop it from value 0 up to the number of entries of the task table minus 1 again because we have four elements uh, and we would like to loop from 0 to 3. And then you formulate your annotation your area an, uh, contains annotation, but this time you are using or referring to the loop counter i. And you do that by using the keyword var. var i uh, evaluates to the current uh, value of the loop counter. And of course you can use that uh, here in the index uh, scope, but also for um, the data uh, in the contains data area. So this was the first example and uh, another uh, application area could for instance be if you have such a computed call annotation um, you would like to specify that the first computed call in routine main the third and the ninth all of the of those three computed calls shall be resolved by calling the message handler routine this can also be um, simplified by the following for loop application you could say that when you are in the routine main, you would start a for loop where you define an offset variable. Uh, and this offset variable shall have the concrete value 1, 3, and 9, and nothing else. So this is the second variant for um, looping um, here uh, through this, this uh, set of values. And there you say instruction and um, you don't have to repeat main because we are already in the scope main but from here we are you want to address the computed one the computed three and the computed nine and all of them call the message handler routine so these are the for loop annotation scopes all right let's come to the improvements in the graphical user interface and i'd like to show you that directly in the tool. I've here prepared an analysis project uh, with uh, three stack analysis for the tasks and two stack analysis for interrupt service routines and some result combination. Um, the first major change in the graphic user interface is the handling of the interactive uh, analysis mode and uh, remember if you select an analysis you have in principle two ways on uh, to start this uh, selected analysis by the automatic uh, analysis or the interactive analysis and the interactive analysis has the advantage to also access the uh, value analysis results um, if you have the value analyzer add-on or for instance in case of the timing uh, analysis you can also access the pipeline state visualization but um, in principle the interactive analysis uh, needs uh, more memory and keeps some inter-socket um, communication open to an active value analysis process in the background so it really needs more memory in, in general um, the first change regarding the interactive analysis is that when you start an analysis and the analysis has finished the, um, the resulting graph will no longer be opened automatically uh, so that you can keep on working in your in your cur current uh, working process and you will not be interrupted uh, by uh, popping up a resulting graph. You have to explicitly um, click on the display analysis result button in order to show the resulting graph. Um, the next change is, uh, let me open or start another interactive analysis, that we keep track on which analysis has been uh, executed in interactive um, analysis mode so you see those two have been executed in interactive analysis mode we also provide a counter uh, here above we have six analysis in total uh, in total and two of them are uh, started in interactive mode so this allows you to, to get a feeling about um, which are still opened and um, where your memory usage uh, may come from 
So this is the, the first um, change in the graphical user interface. Um, the next one, uh, let me have a quick look to the uh, um, overview here, is the sum operator. So um, if you go to the result combination, you could, for instance, be interested in summing the results um, up uh, from the three tasks, res um, stack analysis results. So uh, you would do that traditionally by referring to the task ID here, plus the second ID, plus the third ID, always referred with the hash symbol. And um, well, uh, you can imagine that if you have more than these uh, three tasks, this could be, um, um, uh, yeah, bit of work, um, I mean a bit of work to specify all these um, um, task identifiers. This can be much easier if you just want to sum all the results up. You can now use a new operator, the sum operator, where you just um, refer the name of the group. And in this case we all group them together under the group which is called tasks. Um, for instance you could do of course the same with um, the ISRs, the next group, and then you would get um, a result uh, like this uh, in a much more convenient way uh, specified here. So, and the last um, change I would like to uh, present for the graphic user interface is um, the uh, workspace export, which is now also available um, in the interactive GUI mode. So you remember if you want to use um, the project analysis in batch mode, you would say minus B project APX and we always recommend to export a workspace a file, for instance project WS APX, um, which will save or store the, um, all the results of, of the analysis project, including the visualizations, all the reporting. So this is really a um, convenient way to later resume uh, the analysis state uh, and not to, um, to, re um, to repeat the analysis project again. And this is now also available by or for the uh, interactive uh, GUI mode, uh, the min minus capital B. Uh, which forces the GUI to open even in batch modus when there is at least one warning or error message um, popping up in one of the analysis. So the export workspace is now also, uh, you see this is a spelling error, so it's workspace of course. All right, the, the last category of uh, improvements in this release 18.10 is TimeWeaver specific. TimeWeaver is our hybrid worst case execution time analyzer. And um, we introduce with this release um, new statistic, uh, new interrupt statistic, and an extended uh, uh, trace segment uh, statistics. Furthermore, um, we can now count the traced execution time for external or not analyzed uh, routines um, during the analysis of a task. And we will also discover task switches automatically now. And last but not least, uh, we introduce a new feature which is called interactive or trace streaming via the Infineon DAS uh, tracing server directly out of um, the time viewer for TriCore. So, uh, let me show you uh, these features in more detail in um, the tool later. Uh, before we do that, uh, let me remind you on what TimeViewer um, uh, provides um, for you. So TimeViewer is our hybrid worst case execution time analyzer, which combines um, information from the program flow traces with the traditional static value and worst case path analysis. So like with IT, uh, you read in the executable program, the ELF binary, uh, you specify the entry point, basically the task entry uh, you would like to start with the analysis. And in addition to that, uh, TimeViewer also needs the program flow trace uh, information to extract local instruction level timings. 
And then at the end, um, TimeViewer will compute the worst case execution time estimate based on this uh, tracing information, together with some extended trace coverage report or time variance report. Um, with this release, we introduced this uh, new feature called Trace Streaming. And um, uh, this is quite interesting uh, for those who don't want to invest in an expensive debugging solution, for instance. Um, we uh, offer that feature for um, all uh, Tricore Aurix um, emulation devices. Um, so you can directly connect out of the Time Weaver with a trace server uh, running on, your, on the same local host or uh, on some remote computer. Um, and um, at this computer, the emulation board need to be connected via USB. And then TimeViewer will um, request or send trace requests for the given uh, entry point um, task um, you're, you would like to analyze and waits for um, the receivement uh, reception of um, this interactive MCDS traces in case of Tricore. And then these trace data will be processed like uh, when you have provided uh, external trace data. For the demo, I'm using a simple SCADE generated multi core application. Uh, implementing um, the Rosace framework. Um, this application is running on uh, some Tricore Aurix 275 uh, emulation device here on my desk. And um, this application comes with several tasks um, running in some real time operating system, uh, which is called PXROS HR from a high tech um, partner company of us. So, uh, in especially, we'll find here um, client LED client tasks A and B, um, which send periodical requests to some LED server. Um, and this LED server at the end toggles um, two LEDs on the emulation board um, on request received from this client task. And uh, the interesting thing is that these tasks, uh, the LED client A, is running on, I guess, core zero. Uh, the LED server is running on core one and LED client B is running on core two of this Aurix 275. And uh, additional, in addition to these LED client and server tasks, there are also some SCADE uh, KCG wrapper tasks. Um, the setup looks like this, actually. Um, I'm using the trace streaming um, feature, which I presented before. So I have directly connected um, the Aurix emulation device um, to my computer here. And, um, well, I've done a small video. Hopefully you can see that. Um, they are really um, these LEDs uh, toggling and blinking. And um, that's the simple application running on that board. I've prepared this um, time weaver analysis project for the Rosaccio Multicore uh, application. And um, you remember that this LED client A is running on core 0, the LED server uh, task is running on core 1, and the LED client B is running on core 2. Um, you might wonder why we have uh, split each client and server here into two an uh, separate analysis items. And this is because um, every task um, has a structure that uh, you start with some init sequential initialization phase and then you enter a while one loop, which we call cyclic executive. And here you uh, process infinitely long some uh, messages coming from the different tasks. And um, therefore, uh, we provide a worst case execution time uh, with time beaver for the initialization and for one iteration of this uh, while one loop uh, with this job uh, task. Um, in addition to these LED client and server tasks, we also have the KCG wrapper tasks here in the very same project. Now let's uh, pick the KCG root task um, job here. And if you see on the right side here, the specification of the analysis, um, uh, you directly see a different to um, the previous um, Time Beaver demos. Uh, now we are using this new trace streaming feature. 
um, in, in my setting I have connected the um, to, uh, emulation device, the Tricor Aurix 275 emulation device board directly to my computer here. So uh, I need to first select here the trace format DES to activate that feature instead of using um, a different trace format from from uh, a different debugger like Lauterbach, PLS or iSystem. Um, this time I use Infineon DAS and I need to specify the host name uh, of the computer where the board is connected to and uh, as I said it's directly connected to my local host here so the default can be applied. Next thing is you have to decide uh, whether you want to reset the, dev the device, the, the board first, before you start um, analyzing and uh, stream the trace data or if you uh, continue working or yeah, let the application process um, like it is uh, without resetting it first. Another important setting uh, with the DAS uh, trace streaming is that you manu manually provide uh, the core ID. So I have here an, uh, an uh, analysis configuration core 0 and you additionally have to specify the trace core ID. Alright, um, then let's start analyzing this root task and what you see is that first we perform a decoding and um, a value analysis, a static value analysis and um, as soon as we have um, a graph representation and the value analysis uh, information ready then the trace conversion starts and this actually uh, first connects to um, the emulation device here on my PC and um, observes the concrete execution on that board and at the end it can extract um, the trace snippets for this task and it has seen it um, twice uh, in this case so um, the in the um, root task job was executed twice during the execution and uh, this data is um, transported back to um, the time weaver and then afterwards um, the standard path analysis will uh, be executed um, fi for finding uh, the longest path uh, based on the uh, extracted local um, timings uh, via the trace streaming. So the result is then here 3.253 milliseconds. This is a worst case execution time estimate. And um, well, you can have a look um, to the resulting graph. The result looks like this. Um, we have this um, overall uh, worst case execution time estimate result. You will also get some statistics um, uh, over the, the trace data. As I said, we have two trace snippets. So we have seen twice the execution of the KCG, KCG root task job. Um, so from the entry point of the of the graph, of the analysis, to one of the endpoints, and we have seen uh, two of them. The minimum trace time was 2.99 milliseconds, and the maximum time was 3.199 milliseconds. And well, since we do worst case execution time extrapolation, so we, we combine um, the, the local timings to find the worst case, an overall worst case path, we are um, lying here above the maximum trace time, of course. Okay, um, what I wanted to show you is a new feature uh, in this release and this is related to external routines. Um, you, so I have here, uh, if I go back to my uh, ICE annotation file, you see that I have specified here these mathematical routines, uh, tangents, cosinus, um, pow, sinus and square root. Um, I have excluded them from the analysis and just annotated them to be not analyzed. Um, and also saying for the value analysis that it obeys the calling conventions, but in especially I did not specify any timing for those excluded routines. And what now happens during the time fever analysis is, as you can see here in the graph, that the timing, the worst case timing or the maximum observed timing from the trace data will be uh, taken into account and applied here to this external specified routine nodes. And you can directly see without even having, uh, having analyzed the routines, um, the contribution of them uh, coming from uh, the trace data and here in this case the power routine here uh, contributes an enormous uh, time to the overall um, worst case timing. 
So this is one uh, of the new features. Another one is, or two of them are shown in the statistics. If I open the st statistics, um, you see here first a completely new statistic, which is called trace interrupt statistics. And this um, allows us to see if the task was interrupted by some interrupt handler. And in fact, this uh, KCG root task was interrupted six times um, during uh, our trace uh, execution by some interrupt handler starting at the address 8 0, 0, 0, 20, 20. And the minimal observed time was 0 0.22 microseconds and the maximum timing was 0 0.76 timings, yeah, uh, microseconds. And uh, of course this contribution of the interrupt uh, is subtracted out of um, the task uh, timing. It's not considered for the worst case timing of the task. But for system level um, computations this information might be uh, um, quite helpful and interesting. Uh, for instance, to compute the worst case response timing or uh, scheduling. Then we have uh, improved the trace segment view as well. And uh, here, instead of having the, um, let me see here, one segment which is in more interesting. So you see here uh, distribution graph for that uh, trace segment. So we have um, 22 samples for the segment. Segment consists of a sequence of instructions and uh, well uh, the worst case uh, timing for the segment was uh, 14 cycles and uh, the minimum timings was here yeah, 12 cycles so not that spectacular but um, yeah you have a kind of distribution and we also now provide a polar graph view. Maybe this is uh, a bit more convenient in this case to see that we have just two uh, different values here. So this is also new. And last but not least, um, we can now also detect um, inter um, sorry, not interruptions, but uh, preemptions of the task. And the main challenge here is if the root task was preempted by some other task to identify or to recognize when the execution control comes back to the original root task again. And um, this will be also now detected, but you have to provide a certain address which will be monitored and this will be the task identifier. Um, and you do that in uh, some ICE specification. And I did that here in the global ICE file. Uh, if I select the core zero configuration, I have a special uh, ICE uh, annotation file here. And there is a, a specific attribute, which we call running task. And here you can provide the address of um, yeah, the, uh, the memory cell uh, where you can monitor which task is currently running. And in case of the PXROS HR uh, real-time operating system, um, it's, you can even express that instead of one single address, you can provide an, a formula. And in this case, you can start with some base address, which comes from a small, small data for CPU zero, um, symbol, then you subtract 8000 hexadecimal, you add the px run task address, and you subtract the sbss4 pxros address. This is of course very specific to the real-time operating system, but um, you now have the possibility to provide uh, an address or a symbolic address um, to tell the time viewer where the actual running task is, uh, or ID is, is stored. And that way, um, if the task, and if this memory cell is also traced, is contained in the trace data, the um, analyzer is able to identify task preemptions. So this concludes um, the overview about the latest uh, features in the release version 18.10. If you would like to have um, much more detailed information about this release, uh, please go to www.epsynth.com um, release notes. And in case you have questions, please do not hesitate to write us an email uh, or give us a call. Thank you very much for your interest. I'll take care. Bye-bye.